Hi, I'm Rachel Holmes, and the following is a seven to nine minute video on four specific topics related to ethical practice and the research behind that. Each of the four topics will be discussed specific to the area of education and will include client confidentiality. I'll talk about informed consent, clients turning 18 while in mental health treatment, and parental notification. Additionally, I will discuss which of the four is most easily implemented here at Astray Mountain Community College and why I feel it can be effectively implemented. All right, so to begin with, this informational video meets the requirements as set forth in Module 7 of EPD 820. And it focuses on the topic of research ethics. Um, the text discusses responsible conduct of research, also known as RCR. RCR relates to the professional responsibilities that researchers must follow in terms of research protocol as set forth by the professional organization that the research is being conducted under or the institution the researcher works for and sometimes when it's relevant to the public and the government. So research ethics serve to protect the rights of individuals participating in research studies and to ensure the scientific integrity of the research itself. The goal is to ensure that no harm comes to the research participants and there are even more specific protocols in place to protect the rights of children, the disabled, um, and any individuals with special needs, and that could include individuals with disability or the elderly. So the author of the text, Lefkowitz, further states that while research is not intended to harm participants, it may not necessarily benefit them either. They may benefit indirectly, but the research outcomes ultimately benefit the larger target population. For example, research conducted by an organizational psychologist for a business organization or in a higher education institution um, may be used to influence or improve organizational practices and to make systematic improvements. Because participants often do not directly benefit from the research study that they're participating in, they have the right to know what the research study involves, details about the process and how the study works, what their role is, and then they can choose whether or not to participate. It's also important to note that participants have the right to leave the study at any time if they so choose. So the next topic, um, client confidentiality. This is a must in research studies. Section four of the um, American Psychological Association Code of Ethics, Privacy and Confidentiality, provides very specific guidelines that researchers must adhere to regarding client confidentiality. Section 4.01 states that psychologists have an obligation to take necessary precautions to protect the confidential information and extent of that confidentiality may be those established by the institution or established by law. Section 4.02 of the same code of ethics states that the psychologist in this case, the um, organizational psychologists discuss the limits of confidentiality and, that, um, and how the information will be used. This confidentiality of information must be discussed with or provided to the participant at the start of the research study. And again, that's according to the Code of Ethics, um, APA. The text states that confidentiality also helps to establish trust between the researcher and the participants. It also allows the participants to feel comfortable knowing that they can share as much or as little as they feel comfortable with. Um, Lefkowitz also shares that confidentiality pertains to how the data that's collected is stored. So as a general rule, the data needs to be in a safe um, or some type of locked cabinet where only the researcher has access. In specific studies, longitudinal studies, for example, it may be necessary to track and identify individuals, uh, but after the study is complete, that information should also be destroyed in order to, <coughs> excuse me, maintain confidentiality. Informed consent. So according to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, 
in an article entitled Research and Economic Development, Informed Consent. The author defines informed consent as the knowing consent of the individual and or their legally authorized representative, as is the case with children or those with special needs, um, without any type of inducement, duress, fraud, or coercion of any kind. And that is according to uh, research and economic development. Informed consent essentially means that the researcher provides a participant with key information about the study in understandable terms and provides the reasons why this person should or should not participate in the study. There may be many elements that, there are many elements that are included in informed consent. According to the same article, these include a statement um, that this is a research project and that participation is purely voluntary. It must also state that the participant may withdraw from the study at any time. Another uh, necessary element is a summary of what the research study entails, the process and procedures, and how long the participation is needed. The next required element is a statement that discusses any potential foreseeable risks or discomforts that the participant might encounter during the study. During this informed consent process, a confidentiality statement must also be included, and it must also contain the contact information for the person or persons that they should go to if they have any questions or concerns throughout this study. And finally, the author goes on to state that informed consent is so much more than a simple document. It's not just a document, it's a process. Parental notification. So as related to the topic of informed consent is parental notification. According to the Office for Human Research Protections, parental permissions must be in place if a participant is under 18 years old. Interestingly, parental consent can be done by officially signing and giving informed consent explicitly, but there are situations in which parental consent can be waived. For example, if a study is being done at a school and information is being gathered from students, uh, parent notification is required. So the researcher will often send out a letter or an email to parents notifying them about the research study and explaining the student's role in the study. However, instead of requiring a signed document for everyone to opt into the study, the researcher has the option of asking the parents who do not give consent for their child to send in the form. So all of those who do not send in the non-consent letter are essentially waiving their rights. So in summary, parental notification is absolutely required, but there are different types of parental consent when it comes to minors participating in a research study. Clients turning 18 while in mental health treatment. According to the American Medical Association, when it comes to clients that are under medical or health care treatment, parental consent is required, as is the case with research studies. And the mental health treatment of this same client, once he or she turns 18 years old, the client must now give consent on their own behalf now that he or she is an adult. And that's according to WebMD 2019. At 18 years old, an individual has a right, the legal right to participate or to not participate in a study and determine for him or herself if they would like to continue participating in this research study if that is the case. I will say that I did not find any specific information on this particular topic in the textbook. So I did online research to learn as much as I could about this topic. Hopefully this is on track. <coughs> Confidentiality in higher ed. As a part of this assignment, I've been asked to identify one of the four topics and related to my current role. As a professor at a community college, the topic of confidentiality is constantly discussed. FERPA rules apply to protect student information and to ensure that their rights, um, to ensure their rights to confidentiality once they turn 18. So I have some students that are 18 or older and their parents might inquire via email or phone call on their son or daughter's progress or they might call to intervene if their son or daughter got a low grade on an assignment 
or if I drop them from the class because of excessive absences. Um, it's really not uncommon for parents to try to step in and call me directly for information, uh, but I cannot discuss the student or any information related to the student per FERPA since the student is legally an adult. So confidentiality is huge. And um, what I would say to those parents is, per the law, FERPA, I am unable to disclose any information to you at this time. If your son or daughter attends this college, if they are in this class, please have them contact their instructor directly. Um, similarly, confidentiality is always emphasized when students participate in any type of research study on campus. And this confidentiality is required according to the EMCC IRB process and regulations. Confidentiality is maintained at EMCC in student matters such as disciplinary hearings, where only those on the disciplinary committee have access to the information. Um, and that information from the hearings is not to be shared with anyone outside of the committee other than the student and other people that were directly involved. As a community college professor and a member of many different committees dealing with student issues, I deal with informed consent, confidentiality, parental notification for students that are minors, and following ethical standards and regulations as set forth by the college. All of these things are requirements and something that myself and all other employees have a great deal of training on. So I think that covers everything. Um, it's been my pleasure creating this video presentation on research ethics, and I look forward to learning even more as I continue my degree program and begin my dissertation process very soon. Thank you. Bye.